interpretation this evening are taken from the book of Revelation, the second chapter, beginning at the 18th verse, which were previously read. Grace, mercy, and peace to you, from God our Father, and our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus, when it comes to interpreting scripture or any truth for that matter, especially when it comes to important matters like putting a man to death, the Bible says, but if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses, that every word may be established. We recall Jesus, so called trial before the Sanhedrin where they could not get even two witnesses to agree on anything, except that Jesus said he could tear the temple down and rebuild it in three days. Finally they asked Jesus himself straight out, Are you the Son of God? To which he followed by confessing he was, I am. That is, God. Commentary writers, especially regarding Revelation, if they are worth salt, do the same. They seek two or three witnesses, or cross-references, by searching for cross-witnesses of everything that is said in the book of Revelation. More on this later. Back to Thyatira. We recall the mission journey of Paul in Acts 16.14. One of those listening was the woman named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth from the city of Thyatira, who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. It is interesting to note the ancients extracted fluid from two famous Phoenician sea snails. It's where they got the color, purple. The mention of wealthy and generous Lydia, who was from Thyatira while traveling and selling, this business lady came to the faith and was baptized in Philippi. Lydia was a generous supporter of Paul in the early church, and even housed Paul for a short time. She might have been a major factor for Christianity in the city of Thyatira. We said we'd get back to witnesses that speak of Revelation's words being truth. For Revelation 2, verse 18, which is a repeat of Revelation 1:13, he had eyes like fiery flames. Feet, in this case, speak of control, and we can refer to God's first promise from the Garden of Eden where God says to Satan, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall crush your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Of course, that is speaking of the foot in symbolic language, of which Revelation is full of. We also are reminded from the book of Joshua, the five kings of the Amorites, where it says, Come near. Put your feet on the necks of these kings. A foot pushed down upon one's neck means he was under control and wasn't going anywhere. Verse 19 is the good news prior to the bad news which is about to follow. These words serve as a reminder that though a church or person may have some good qualities, God takes sin very seriously. It is not like Islam's teaching which says, if your good works and God's balance of justice is more than your bad works, then you're going to heaven. And all it takes is just one more good work. We are reminded indirectly here that it only takes one sin with God to wind up in hell. The Bible says, Behold, I was shaped in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. Last Wednesday, Pastor Tuman mentioned Balak and Balaam from the Old Testament, in conjunction with the Church of Pergamum. 
You will see that this message also speaks of characters from the Old Testament. For example, verse 20 Jezebel, as mentioned in this verse, as this prophetess claimed to know God's will. She will cause havoc and deceive many. We are reminded of Ahab's wife, the real life Jezebel, who had 450 false prophets, and a type of ministry that mixed worship with sexual immorality, and which God killed with a great miracle showing all he is the one true God, through Elijah. In verse 21 is a reference to God giving Jezebel a chance to repent of her sins, yet instead, she devises a plan to acquire Naboth's vineyard. In this slide, we see Ahab sulking on his bed, because Naboth refused to sell it. Verse 22, Jezebel will see God's judgment coming upon her, in the form of being thrown out a window and later beaten by dogs. Hence, the stern warning. We are reminded of the pleasures of sin lasting for only a short time. Solomon spoke of such with his words, with much enticing speech she caused him to yield. With her flattering lips, she seduces him. Immediately he went after her, as a dox goes to slaughter. He did not know that it would cost him his life. In spite of her immorality, God still gives her a chance to repent. In verse 23, Jezebel was going to get what was coming to her. That also includes a warning for the whole church, of Thyatira, and, people like you and me, who read these words, who heed not Jesus' warning. We are reminded of Paul's words, Do not be deceived, God cannot be mocked, a man shall weep what he sows. In our own LCMS, we have pastors that can't agree on who should receive the Lord's Supper. Also, we have disagreements regarding the office of ministry and women as pastors. Though we have clear statements regarding the sin of abortion and the sin of homosexuality. There are pastors and numerous lay people who disagree with those statements. They have a kind of worship wars they engage in. We also have division regarding what types of liturgies and music to use, contemporary or traditional. If this is the way it is in the LCMS, imagine the rest of the division in the other visible churches. We have a problem. On the one hand, we can't do a thing about that problem because we are all sinners. But on the other hand, by what Jesus did on the cross, we have been given the power to change things to make them right, God-pleasing and holy. Back to our text. In verse 24, we see the Lord's patience revealed to those in Theodira who don't follow along with Jezebel's evil ways. He says, I will put no other burden on you. But for the sinners in that church, who do know the depths of Satan, we are reminded God will judge our church and nation, for sins such as abortion and gay marriage, and also adultery and another sin that has become commonplace, living together prior to marriage and premarital sex. In 1 Corinthians, we have an example of excommunication for sexual sins. In other words, we see the sins of Jezebel, and her of Jezebel spirit, present here in our own times as well. Clearly, the congregation is to rebuke him and her, but rebuke the person in love always love, so that the person can repent. As a result, the rebuke actually becomes a gift of rebuke, 
to the guilty party as well as their church. In 1 Corinthians, a man was sleeping with his stepmother. Public rebuke is intended to lead the person to his or her repentance, and once they repent, the church rejoices. Every action within and outside the church is to be done in love. C. Bert Becker, a wonderful Wisconsin Synod professor and commentator of Revelation with his book, The Distant Triumph Song says, the mention of deep things should alert us to a real danger that still threatens the church today. My Christian friends of Emmanuel, where do we start? Verse 25, our hope is found in Christ alone and his word in which we hold fast to. Like those in the good soil, there are those who, hearing the word, hold it fast and are honest in heart, and bear fruit with patience. Luke 8 15. Now in verse 26, we have a beautiful promise of power. A promise reminiscent of Matthew 28, 18, All power is given unto me, in heaven and on earth. Then Jesus gives it to all of us, and not just pastors, in the Great Commission. And then another beautiful promise, Jesus saying, Lo, I will be with you always. The words here speak to those who believe, and keep God's word to the end. Those words go hand in hand with the promise we heard in our Lenten service two weeks ago from Revelation 2, 10, Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. Professor Baker adds, The Greek word here does not mean only to observe with intention, but also to putting into practice. Oh, do we see a lot of that, just observing today. But what about putting it into practice? It kind of reminds us of the Randy Travis song, Good Intentions, where we hear the words, The road to hell is paved with good intentions. Verse 27 reminds us of Psalm 2 verse 9, you shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Theodira also made pottery. Like the discarded broken pots that abounded around them, Christ would shatter the kingdoms of the earth as pottery of his coming, which for us is sooner than later. Thus far, this message has contained a lot of God's law. Some messages, especially ones in the Old Testament, were like that. Though the Ten Commandments are both law and gospel. In the New Testament, Jesus' death was an example of God's law, as he was the end of the law. But gospel for all believers. Judgment Day, from the New Testament, is similar to the Ten Commandments because it too is about law and gospel. Law to the sinner and gospel to the believer. For with God, who is love, there is always gospel. In verse 28, Jesus referred to himself as the bright morning star. He offers himself to the congregation. We see mention of Jesus being the morning star also, in 2 Peter 1.19, where it says, Until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. We will hear the mention of morning star again in Revelation 22.16. It will go with this promise that Jesus will in the end win the final victory. It's what Revelation is all about. Finally, in verse 29, there are those beautiful words again, that is, to the believers, he who has an ear, let him hear. The question then becomes, are people listening? The believers, yes. But to lose the unbeliever, that sound is like the sirens going off in London when the German Luftwaffe approached. 
It was a sound of terror and destruction. We pray to God for such ears to hear for our congregation, and each of us personally throughout the world. In closing, I just wanted to mention the goal, the melody and on how we achieve the means. Our goal was, and is, to make it to heaven on Judgment Day. Our melody, like those of Thyatira, is that we are sinners, destined to hell. The means for achieving our goal is always the same, that we believe and identify with Jesus' death on the cross, and his resurrection, along with the free gift of faith, until Jesus returns, and then we won't need it anymore. Also, in a very real sense, he gives us his Holy Spirit, his word, and his sacrament. We can hear this means of God's grace, 10,000 times 10,000 times every day and like his love, never get tired of it. To God be the glory, in Jesus' name, Amen.